on the money. So yeah, like man, I'm I'm nothing if not consistently mostly on time. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. We'll give everyone like a couple seconds, a little bit to get on, maybe another minute. Um, but uh, yeah, good to have you on, Gunner. Yeah, thanks. I'm glad to be here. Been trying to like fish with your finger mullet forever, but it's been on a stock or your season geezer. That's what I've been trying to fish with. Thing looks sweet. It'll spoil you really, really <laughs> quick. <laughs> good. And I don't have to tie streamers if I use that. So yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Anywho, everyone, I'm Ethan. I'm the community <coughs> manager for Reddington and uh, Rio here at Far Bank. And uh, this is Gunnar Brammer, one of our SIG tires. Um, Gunnar, where are you from? Uh, born and raised Traverse City, Michigan. Uh, a lot of time in the UP and currently, I think it's been six years now, my wife and I have been in Duluth, Minnesota. So, Awesome. A, a general progression northern and towards the middle of nowhere. That's <laughs> basically where we live. Sweet. Yeah. Cool. So a uh, little Vout Gunner, he ties a lot of warm water flies and stuff. And why don't you tell him what you're into fishing wise? Like, yeah, I want to hear from you, not me. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, you could. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so, you know, I, I actually started pretty hardcore articulated trout flies. And that's, that's a weird place to start, but that's where I started articulated trout flies. Like hmm. uh, I think the first pattern I ever tied was Kelly Zuku. Oh, like, nice. Talk about an introduction into fly fishing. It's like, no, 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 no. I want a six weight and I want a 200 grain full sinking line. some 20 pound maximum. Like, let's go. Uh, and I got to work for Kelly. And so that mm -hmm. was like, I don't know. I just indoctrinated into articulated trout. So uh, that's where I started. But when we moved to Duluth, I mean, Duluth has trout fishing. I'm not trying to like downplay that, but it's certainly not like Kelly's version of trout fishing like well the season geezer i'll tell you that that thing has fooled a great many brook trout <laughs> our little creeks up here but beside the point uh something duluth has in abundance is smallmouth and pike and musky fishing and i mean you're talking about kind of an epicenter around the mississippi the saint croix the flambeau ashland like i have access to a lot of world-class fisheries and in duluth we have the st louis and so my tying and fishing over like the six years that we've been here has been, I wouldn't say warm water. It's, it's turned into warm water, but it's been East coast, saltwater, striped bass, hmm. striped bass, striped bass, striped bass, because the, the moving from, <laughs> I mean, they have everything out there. It's, I love like Bob Popovic has probably been the most influential on my recent time. And we'll probably say that way forever, but the progression of like three to four to five to eight to 12 to 14 inch full size bait fish profile patterns, usually involving bucktail. Um, but I mean, the whole spectrum has moved a lot from the articulated trout flies to single hook predator, big game, warm water patterns sweet so, yeah. and we're gonna tie your pheasant bugger today uh yeah. how did that like come about what was the impetus of that <clears throat> so in 2018 i was at the international fly tying symposium first year i've ever been there and i kid you not they stuck me at a table with jason taylor and bob popovic so like my mind is freaking out and i'm just like trying not to embarrass myself the whole weekend and uh like second morning i show up bright and early jason's there we're drinking coffee and he whips out this pattern on the table to show everybody. And I think he calls it just a pheasant rump uh, deceiver. Maybe he calls it a pheasant rump deceiver. And I had never tied with a pheasant skin. I'd never seen pheasant rump before, but the hmm. colors on that thing, because he had like this nice little copper ribbed body with the, the iridescence of the pheasant feathers all tapered back. And I was like, that is smallmouth crack because all my waters are like really tannicky coffee color. And that brownish, coppery color, oh, man. We, I mean, we probably had, like, if you just walk in the water, we have tens of thousands of little bait fish, like, two inches long that are that color. Mm. I'm like, Jason, what is this? It's like, it's pheasant rope. And he starts walking me around the show, and we find some pheasant rope feathers. And he's explaining me how to use it. And I'm just, like, dissecting this thing, like, trying to figure out how to tie it the moment I get home, which is exactly what I did. I went home, and I tied, like, three variations and sent them pictures and did a little back and forth. And 
what was interesting is sorry this is a long story oh no but, dude go for it we got plenty of time at the same time i was watching a lot of tom bell's videos and uh tom he developed the sunray line of fly rods mm -hmm. and lines and stuff and something he advocates a lot is kind of downsizing uh and lighter line fishing for stealth and delicacy but also you know using the full weight of the rod and really bending it into them and they're just a lot of different stuff and i wanted to try it for smallmouth because i've always been like eight weight cover the most you can do with one rod like you know hit them hard and strip them home like sure and i was like a lot of my roots in the midwest were like growing up walleye fishing with an ultra like a medium light rod it's like i, I kind of like finesse fishing a lot same. So I started a whole thing of uh, videos called the Four Way Chronicles, mm -hmm. and it was paired around two ideas. I wanted to fish a light rod with a floating line, which almost everybody has, and I wanted it to be like just under kind of a fair game for a smallmouth. Like I really wanted to work for it, sight fish, get the right cast in, and like make it ultra light. Like I wanted to finesse fish these bass. Which at the same time I'm fishing like a twelve pound leader, so it's not like well, finesse trout. They it's can't like, see it anyway. The situation is finesse, but once I hook the fish, it's like bent to the cork. Like get in here in twenty seconds. But anyway, uh, the second part of that video series was all the flies were designed around pheasant skins and kind of like a minimalistic fly tying approach. So I think I, I don't know if I did like six or seven or maybe even now it's like eight videos in that whole series. And all of them are like a pheasant skin plus one material. Hmm. And there's a like two different crayfish, three or four different bait fish patterns, little bugger jigs. Like it's like pretty well rounded for just a little series. And they're all inch, inch and a half, two inch micro streamers, which I don't see. It's like, you know, can you streamer fish with a four weight? And of course, everybody's like, what are you talking about? What do you mean streamer fishing with a four weight? It's like, mm, you can do it. If you, totally. if you really wanted to, you can have these really sick little inch and a half micro baits that you can flick around and swim around the stream. And they're all based on pheasant skins. So this bugger pattern, because this story is forever long back in college, we used to tie jigs and we'd tie marabou jigs on like, you know, 16th, eighth, quarter like pretty big and we fish them for walleye and splake and lake trout and pike and carp on spinning rods and my buddy uh he's not a fly tire but he has like a fly tying setup kind of hmm. and my favorite thing about him his name's john littlefield and instead of looking at it like a fly tire because we all do and imitating other fly tires because that's what we all do he's like well i'm trying to imitate a crayfish so he just kind of tie a crayfish and like who cares if, if it looks like crap who cares if he had horrible technique? Who cares if it looked completely disgusting in the water? That thing was a crayfish, and he always outfished me. Hmm. And so I tried to really adapt that and get away from kind of the woolly bugger side of things and be like, what are the key elements of a suggestive fly that I could tie that, one, you can't tie wrong, and two, you can't fish wrong? And totally. the bugger jig is it's, – it's the fly. Like if I, if you were like, if I had to feed my family and I was only allowed one fly, like this would be the fly because it's like, I could catch smallmouth, largemouth, carp, crappie, walleye, channel cats, trout. Like it, it literally doesn't matter. A cool. little you inch and a half question of brown like how bug, many species did you catch on it? And perfect. it's been insane. It's, take it to any river, any river in June, July, and August and just throw it in. Just see what Sweet. happens. I dare you. It's it's a cool little bug. <laughs> cool. So, yeah. Um, cool. You want to show us our first steps of like how to tie it? Yeah, it's a pretty quick pattern. Okay. Uh, and I could, I mean, we could run through this thing lickety split, but let me jump over to my cool. my big camera here. While you're doing that, how long ago? How long have you been tying for? Fifteen years. Ooh, Fifteen years. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. It was uh, two years after I started fishing, the winter after I started fly fishing, if that makes sense. And, and why did you like... start tying? <clears throat> so <laughs> I know it was a long time ago, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the reason I started tying, my dad, he took me on a skiing trip out to Colorado. His sister lives out there, and um, he knew why I wanted to fly fish. So we're skipping the whole why I started fly fishing story real quick, but he knew why I wanted to fly fish was because I wanted to catch a pike. 
it's a weird story of how to get there, but that's how I rationalized it. I wanted to catch pike. Fly fishing was the means that I thought I could do it because we had taken a bunch of Canadian family fishing trips. Oh, and that's I'm, the way uh, to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, we did this trip. Uh, the first year, of course, you know, my dad and his buddy, they catch some big pike. There was another group of older boys and then me and a buddy, and they had caught some big pike. The next year, and like the cool thing about Canada is the dads were, they were pretty relaxed about Canada. Like we'd get back and the dads were all drinking scotch and smoking cigars and they taught us all how to play euchre and we were all on teams. So it's the dads against the older boys against the younger boys and we'd all take turns and watch and we'd stay up to like 1 a.m. and just tell stories and play cards and then wake up at six and fish. And so one night, this was like year two, my dad's telling me about how they were fly fishing, which I didn't even know what that was. I didn't even know my dad had a fly rod. They were fly fishing frogs in the lily pads. And he's like, we could see these, you know, the pike would come up and try to knock them off the lily pad and get it in the water and try to eat it. And the next day I woke up and I saw the rod. He, he had it hung across like the fireplace mantle of this cabin in Canada. And I'm like, what is this thing? He's like, well, it's a fly rod. Remember the, the frog story? This is what we were doing. And I'm like, okay, when we get home, I'm, we're getting a fly rod. Like, I want, I want that. Because in Sweet. two years, everybody has caught a pike but me, and that needs to end, right? So I was like, in my brain, fly fishing was how I was going to catch a pike. And he knew this. So when we did our little Colorado trip, he uh, he brought Kelly Gallup's book, Modern Streamers for Trophy Trout. And it's quite funny because I hated reading as a kid. And I read that book cover to cover in one plane ride and was just wow. like, like this is worth reading like this is some good stuff and i was doodling flies on the napkins from the like the coast drinks or whatever they gave you in the airport and i was like doodling flies and trying to come up with names like i was always screwing around i'd never even tied a fly i was like but he's got those pictures of the zoo cougar and the butt monkey and everything's at the end of the book and i was like sketching them and trying to understand what was what. And it's like, I knew the minute I saw that and read that book, I was like, I want to make lures. Like I want to, and I would screw around. Like as soon as I got a vice, I'd take like rabbit zonkers, palmer it onto a hook, make a tail and then treble hook or a split ring that onto like a daredevil. So I had like a rabbit zonker trailer on a daredevil. Like I would just screw Sweet. around with stuff all the time. And so that winter I was like, I need a vice. I want tools. And because I had read Kelly's book, my dad's like, get them the stuff for a zoo cougar. Like, hmm. why not? And it's kind of funny because my dad's not really a fly fisherman. I mean, he fly fishes, but at the time, my guess is he had been like twice. Like, it's not like he had, you know, he had like one eight weight and it was a saltwater flats rod that it's he casual. bought for a trip with his buddies, not because he was into fly fishing. So I've kind of had to drag him along with me so that we're, <laughs> can at least speak the same language. Do you still have that first zoo cougar or did you fish it? no way i mean maybe <laughs> just curious I, I have so i don't throw stuff away and in my garage i have i mean i have probably 1500 2000 25 i don't even know they're just cardboard boxes that are just full of flies oh my god just full of them all right not so fishing over flies. they're like week. you know <laughs> You know, when you're like 14, you're yeah. like, this is the best fly I've ever tied. Like, I still have that somewhere. I have no idea where, but it's there. I kept those in my friend box that I give to them and let them <laughs> use on the stream. Yeah, what are you using? Great. Oh, it's one of these. It's killer. <laughs> It'll get them. Cool. But yeah, we can we can jump into the fly. All right. Sweet. Let me see if I can switch cameras here. And yeah. Get rocking. Yeah. Perfect. How is yours already done? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I took the shortcut. <laughs> but um, we're going to be tying on a jig hook. Uh, kind of my two favorites. A-Rex has this PR, was it the 374, 90 degree. And size two and size four, those are kind of what I use most often. And I'm going to rig that with a five 30 seconds slotted tungsten bead. Now, you got to be a little uh, tricky because the slotted tungsten is technically designed for a 60 degree jig hook. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't always like the 90 degree bends. And so like that five thirty second fits the two and the four, but it doesn't fit the one. So you got to be careful with your bead size. If it doesn't fit, you just put it on backwards and then you can just kind of like manhandle it into place and it works. So just keep that in mind. But five thirty seconds is pretty much perfection for fishing it, you know, completely weightless, 
kind of on a swing, on a jig, on a dead drift, like you have a lot of play to fish, you know, six inches down to about three feet on how you rig your tippet and give it slack and all that stuff. So it's a pretty universal weight. And then uh, for thread, I like mono. This is Danville. It happens to be six thousandths of an inch. And the mono's clear. And the pretty sick thing about that is we're ba I'm going to kind of counter red the body with my tying thread just for durability. So it's just a cool. time saver. But you can just start your thread up there. Put down a big old thread base all the way down to the bend like right down to the barb and i'm going to run all the way back up and make sure that thread base is nice and locked down and when did you start tying with like mono not exclusively but we were just talking earlier and you use it a lot yeah it's no it's it's basically universally now um cool and it all started like when i started reading bob popovic's book fly design I didn't understand mono thread. I didn't understand why he used it. I didn't understand advantages, disadvantages. And it was, I thought it was just some old thing. Like you know, hmm. that's what fly tires did 50 years ago. They just used mono thread. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they just took a spool of mono and, you know, wound it on. But um, because of that book, I tried it. And coming from, you know, Kelly's big on GSP. So of course I started with like 100, 150, 200 GSP. Uh, and then I had like a Pat Cohen phase where I learned to stack hair. So I was still on GSP. Uh, Strollis promotes a lot of power thread. So I tried the Vivas 140 power thread. Bowen ties a lot with like 210 uh, Flymaster Plus. So then I gave that a try. And when I jumped to mono, I would break it and break it and break it because I was so used to really having the strongest thread you can have, kind of. And uh, and so I had this cool phase where I learned to tie with mono because I started with six thousandths, got frustrated, jumped mm -hmm. to eight thousandths, which is quite a bit stronger. It's like GSP level. Like you can really, really beat it. down some stuff with that. But the problem is, is this all co-evolves with my progression and learning of Bucktail and six thousandths teaches you how to not overdress a fly because you can't overdress a fly with six thousands because you break the thread and it, it it has this really cool interplay between the compressibility of the hair because it's mono is really round it's really hard coated so you can really compress the hair and get a lot of locking power on the material but it's also elastic so it's forgiving so like if your little thread path isn't perfectly circular but you're tying under tension the elasticity eats up those inconsistency so you always have this kind of constant pressure thread path nothing ever backs off it knots really well so you have hitch and stuff like everything seats really well um i think you so, just converted me to using bucktail again <laughs> it's it's so cool and so if you start with eight thousands and then force yourself to do six which is the Danville size the mm -hmm. fine mono uh it'll really teach you to tie kind of like perfectly sparse okay and it's it's, and so now I just use it for everything. Um, occasionally, like if you watch my bucktail dubbing loop head video, I'll still use GSP. And I've even done that with the 8000 mono. Uh, okay. But they're like specialty situations. So the mono is cool. like exclusively what I do for just about everything. Sorry, that was a pretty big Sweet. side. No, side dude, it's cool. <clears throat> so when you look stuff. at uh, this bugger jig, if you look at it, the coolest thing to me about this is it can literally imitate uh, everything. I mean, it's literally like we have mayfly over potters, over positors. We got a big abdomen, like a swimming abdomen for like uh, burrowing mayflies, big stoneflies, dragonflies have a huge one. If you were going to do a dragonfly, I'd probably use two plumes of marabou, but they have a big old abdomen on them. Hmm. And then we kind of just like skip all the stuff that's like a lot of focus on nymphs. Like they always focus on this part, but we put the abdomen down here. And so this is kind of just your thorax and we veil over it with picky legs and this becomes your either crayfish legs it becomes mayfly legs stonefly legs dragonfly legs or if you swing it it veils over the fly and becomes basically a minnow shaped body like a perfectly little teardrop minnow shaped body so we have kind of all these things that all have a purpose but the purpose of each of them kind of changes how you fish it honestly it, it kind of depends on how you retrieve it hmm. Um, so I'm just going to come in. This is pheasant tail. It's the only material that's not on the actual skin, right? So the whole fly is just tied with a pheasant skin. Sure. 
But to get that kind of long overpositor tail, which is like your mayfly, classic mayfly kind of egg laying thing, or your crayfish antennae, right? Same kind of uh, suggestive quality. You're going to pluck off like maybe five. And I tend to run it twice the hook length. So if you got the size four, it's a little bit shorter. The size two, you'll see it's almost the full length of that pheasant tail. And I'll lock that in and kind of control it back so they all stick together in a nice slicked back line. And just get that kind of garbage stuff tied in. And this to me is the coolest part of this skin. You know, the rump feathers, everybody loves the rump. The rump is kind of like the most useful part of the bird. But if you buy a whole skin and not just like a rump patch, like holy grail noise, right? You sure. get this like absolutely sick marabou that's on the hide. And I cannot find kind of this color or quality of marabou really on anything except like kind of the whiting. Uh, whiting has this really cool chickaboo patch, soft hackle chickaboo. Yep. And that's pretty similar. Like if you were to do this in different colors, that's what the product you'd use is whiting chickaboo. But this brown in my dirty water, like this is the greatest color brown I've ever seen. So you just take one plume of marabou right off that hide. But the trick is this is not like a streamer tail. You can't tie this in like a zoo cougar tail. You have to think kind of in the nymph mindset of this is an abdomen, like a swimming. If you ever see a dragonfly, they're so big, and that thing just paddles around. That's what they used to swim with. So you got to get your fingers wet, trying to control this, and you got to force yourself. It's kind of hard to do to tie it short. Like you should have that uh, tail section, the tail fibers from the pheasant, at least like a half inch past that thing to get the right proportions so that you can get the, the nymph suggestive qualities out of it and make sure it works. So I'm going to trap that down like nice, you know, three or four turns, print it up, race up to that hook eye, and then use that to kind of lock the bead in place and build up just general body proportions and kind of get some meat on the hook here. Cool. I, I've honestly never used this part, and that's awesome when you get to use every little part. And this stuff moves great. Like, I will definitely be using this separately on some of my other lake flies. <laughs> oh, for sure. And... And so I, I've done this body like three different ways now, and I'll show you the most uh, material conservative way to do it. Um, and so before, like if I'm just going for speed, I'll take that marabou, I'll tie it in by the tip and just kind of like run it up the body and like treat it like a chenille almost. Like literally okay. you just cord up all the stuff, wrap it up, and then run your thread over and back because we're kind of skipping the body. The body's I could care less. Like – we got the tail, we got the abdomen. I want the big, bushy, picky legs. And what's super cool is obviously you have the head from the bead, and you can do like a natural head, like black, or you can do like a hot spot because of our dirty water. Um, and uh, But for beginners, you can't crowd the hook eye. I'll tell you what, tying on Jake hooks with beads, if you've never tied a fly before, this is the slickest way to get into it because that – proportionality of trying to gauge where you are on a hook is really irritating. Sure. And it's hard to get a, it's a skill that takes a long time to develop, but the bead, it, it makes it so you can't do it wrong. Anyway. So the, <laughs> I'm all over the place. You're good. The, nah. the way that you're going to get the most use out of this, because we bought this for the rump and we bought this for the marabou. It's like you have all these shoulder feathers and all this stuff up in the neck and all this stuff right up before the rump that I don't really know how to use it. So I'm going to show you how to make feather dubbing. And it's really sweet. It's Yeah, it's super easy. So check this out. You're going to come in and take – I'm going to be right, right up here in the shoulder. I don't okay. I have no idea what to use these feathers for. Uh, and if you just take a pluck out. You'll see, though, the shafts of them are kind of the same quality and the same material style as the marabou tail. Same color, same everything. Now, if you took this and you were to preen it off, you'll get all these microfilaments on the end that are white, and it's part sure. of the stem, right? You don't want that. It gets really difficult to dub that onto the body, and they'll stick out and pick out, and they're kind of a gross color. So you come in with your scissors, and you just cut literally just cut up the stem 
and just shave the feathers off one of the one side of the stem and shave them off the other and just make a, a pile right on your tying table. By the way, this will make a disgusting mess all over <laughs> your house. It'll just like float in the air, float up your nose. It gets caught on your socks. That's why I keep the mini vacuum next to my tying station. It's, it's like pretty bad. Best invention ever. <laughs> now you can run this just as the naked marabou. That's how I do probably 95% of mine. If you were more into a bait fish mode or maybe a bright sunny day uh, conditions or something, you can just add literally just a little dusting of flash into this mix. And it's so easy to do. You, I'm, I, I'll just do it because it's easy yeah, to show you how much. I mean, you're talking like, uh, like literally like, I don't know, 30 fibers, 10, 15 fibers. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> So then you just come in with some dub wax. And because you shaved it off, I'll just, I call it tossing the salad, but you just like kind of uh, bring this mess of feathers up here and dub this onto your thread. And this is a cool thing to practice as a beginner because of what it's going to force you to do is it's going to force you to try to build the taper where you got skinny getting bigger and having those proper proportions. And that's just a, unbelievable skill to have in building anything. I mean, nymph, streamers, bait fish, it, it doesn't matter. Being able to kind of create that taper is huge. And you can see it gets a little messy. You just unwind it, pull it off, wind it back up. Yeah, I seem when I taught classes, that was definitely the, the thing overdubbing is what most people had problems with. Yeah, but this feather, I didn't dub it on super tight. It's kind of hard because the feather, it's it's loosey-goosey. You can't really force it on or else it'll kind of break. Hmm. And so what I do, because this isn't the most durable and it's kind of bushy and picky and kind of gross looking, but again, people, this is not a nymph. You got to work with me here. I am a streamer tire. We're going to strip this thing and swing this thing and jig this thing, but I'll take my mono because it's clear and I'll literally rib down. Perfect. And then rib back. And this is like everything you're like taught not to do in fly tie. It's just like you just break the rules. You just they don't matter. The rules don't matter. And you can just kind of pick that out so that it, you know, traps a little bit of water. It looks like gills. It has a little bit of flowiness to it. But the goal here is suggestivity. I don't just made that word up, right? Suggestivity. Yeah. No, I'm totally all about that, especially when nymph tying and stuff like that. It's like, if it looks close enough and you fish it confidently, you're going to catch fish. Oh, for sure. For sure. So then here's the kicker. And this is one of the reasons why you got to kind of get the skin. Uh, the skin has quality rump. And I'm going to choose one feather from kind of the primo section, especially on the size two. On the size four, you can get away with kind of two medium length feathers. But I'm going to get one long, one medium. We're going to literally tie the stems in at the same time and just try to get one and a half turns on there. That's basically all you're going to need to finish this fly off. Let's see if I can find some decent feathers. And if you've never seen the pheasant rump, it's this beautiful, it has just natural iridescent sheen to it, super picky, perfectly natural color especially for crayfish oh my goodness is this a disgusting color combo uh, <clears throat> and when you take these feathers if you kind of just flick it you'll see where the feather likes to bend you see where the shaft has that kind of natural flex point that's where you're going to kind of strip it away and cut it right at that natural flex and that's what you're going to tie in if you tie it in too far you know down you'll have a big old stiff shaft that'll crack on you when you go to turn it so i'll just pair those up one on top of the other, which is kind of awkward to do because the feathers aren't the same length. You can see my tips, you know, they don't end at the same spot. I'm going to tie those in. Just get them on the hook however you have to. Like I don't, there's no special technique to this or anything. Just get them on there. You are going to need some hackle pliers. It's pretty hard to manipulate with your fingers. And the only downside to pheasant is that it's a short stemmed hackle. You know, it's not like you can get like five turns on here. You're going to get maybe one and a half. And those are concave back. So the natural curve of the feather is going back toward the hook. I'm going to preen them back so they're all laying on top of each other in the same direction. I'm going to get that nice turn and a half. Come back to the other side. 
catch that guy. I bet <laughs> if you don't tie streamers, I'm sure this looks disgusting, but you just got to <laughs> – there's something here you got to just manhandle it with your thread and tame those fibers. And so what I did is it's something I try to do really with everything I try to do. When you tie in that stem, that stem's exposed. And if you just turn it twice and then catch it, it's still exposed. And it only takes like one tooth to break it out. Hmm. And so I took my thread. If you can see it, it's literally on top of the feather. Like I took it back from the bead over the feather and then I pulled the feathers off to either side so that they have that kind of flare picky leg look. So I just totally manhandled it. You know, it's not about this perfect tie-in. It's about getting it in and then controlling it with your thread to get that right kind of end result. And then you just tie it off. If you can find the tips of your hackles, I'd break them out. There's one of them. Give me this. Cool. Give me this. I'm going to break it. There we go. Man, that's it. Sweet. That'll hunt. Yeah, it looks great. Might and have just to fish one this drop this <laughs> right there, and you're you're locked in and golden. What was the first fly you tied that you knew like that was picked up by a company or that like did really well for you on your site or like you knew you were on to like being a really good tire? Uh well, it's kind of funny a lot because of questions. <laughs> The, the first fly I ever thought, like, this is this is something really good. It's funny because I totally just stole John McClure's Kill Whitey. And it was kind of completely by accident, but he had brought it into the shop. I'm trying to re remember how this all went. Because John, I mean, John had been, Johnny's working on this thing for like two years. And I just kind of like see it up on the counter and I just kind of like, you know, the streamer thing. Like I just kind of like fondled his fly and then like put it back. And then I went back to my Airstream and I tied this like basically it's like a sex dungeon, but with a full laser dub head, but with a cactus chenille body instead of hackle. But it's like everything about it was the same as John's Kill Whitey, just without the ostrich. Like it was identical. And I had no idea. Other than I just saw this line. I thought I had this cool idea. And for like the coolest thing about the Madison. So if you've ever been up there, if you can go like a week after peak runoff, as soon as the water starts coming down, it's super muddy. It's disgusting. Nobody's there. Everybody's fishing salmon flies in Idaho. Uh, the streamer fishing is ungodly good. It's, it's, it'll blow your mind. Literally, every, if you don't see a fish every three minutes, like you're doing something wrong. And, and are you throwing big stuff at the bank or like, Oh yeah. Like big stuff, okay. like uh, an inch from the bank, six inches from the bank, yep. a foot from the bank and not even casting, like drawing a circle and whack, like fishing, like five feet of fly line, strip, 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 swack, strip, 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 whack, strip, strip. Like it's, it's insane. And of course it was like the first time I was such a noob when Kelly hired me. It's unbelievable that he actually hired me. And the, like the first good day streamer fishing I had, I had on this random fly that I thought I created and I caught, I mean, I, I caught like 25 fish in an hour and a half, like mm -hmm. average size was like 16 inches. And I was just like, like, what is happening? Like, this is unreal. <laughs> and it was totally John McClure's kill lady. So that was the best idea I've ever had is somebody's fly. I just knocked right off. I mean, I feel like we've all been there at some point. And Sorry, you know, Johnny. you just both run to the same great idea. So, you yep. know, and so I've, I've uh, adjusted that now. Uh, and I combined it with a different fly that um, Jeremy. So Jeremy, he had took me between the lakes. So there's a pretty special section between Hebgen and Quake where all the fish from Quake will run up and, and kill stuff, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and the lower set, I mean, it's unbelievable streamer fishing. And Jeremy took me there and he had this ridiculous triple articulated massive like i've never seen a fly that big like it was like a proper sculpin a, a real proper six inch sculpin and he caught like a big 23 big kiped male out of the lake right on an undercut and he gave me that fly and it's up here and I, I can't show you because he didn't tie it but it was a gift from somebody and it was supposed to be under the wraps and that fly is what i modeled my triple sculpt daddy after 
hmm. combined with so the triple sculpt idea is that fly combined with John McClure's Kill Whitey, like my original knockoff, and I put the two together to kind of give me some breathing room here. And that thing is the runoff master. Like I don't hmm. if if I had ever in Montana in June, I only have a box of six and a half inch triple sculpt daddies. It's the only thing I'll throw. Sweet. And you'll just move fish that you don't know are there. You wouldn't believe they're there. It's like Kelly has this little side channel behind the shop. And we went there maybe like two years after I left. We went there with my wife and some of our friends. And I remember I walked back to the shop and I walk into Kelly and I'm like, dude, there's a 22 inch in your channel. Like I threw this big old six and a half inch black triple sculpt daddy and this fish like mid channel just comes up and chases the thing. And I'm just like, like I lived here and I never once saw a fish that big in that channel. Like that was insane. So that's the sweet, the trophy finder. So if you had to target one species for the rest of your life, what would it be? And only one. <clears throat> Am I fly fishing? It's super hard. <laughs> yeah. Fly fishing. Fly because, fishing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. If it's on the fly, it'd probably be musky. Hmm. If you broke down that barrier, it would probably be lake trout. Hmm. If I could, I would vertical jig lake trout probably every day for the rest of my life. If I, if I had huh. to choose. Sweet. But fly fishing musky is, that's the game. Nice. At least awesome. currently, that's the current game. Yeah, I know. Because I'm not going to lie. I mean, ever since I was in college, I wanted musky to be the thing I wanted the most. And it's funny because if you actually go musky fishing, it'll take like three trips before you really start hating your life. Like sure. musky fishing is not fun. It's not fun. There's nothing fun about it. And uh, and so like the first two or three years, you have to medicate with smallmouth. I mean, that's literally what smallmouth mm -hmm. fishing is. Smallmouth fishing is... I need a break from getting my butt kicked and I just want to go put, you know, 20 fish in the net and an hour and a half of weight fishing and, and feel like you got to boost your ego a little bit. Sure. And then you can go back to musky fishing. So I, if I could only fish for one thing, musky fishing would kind of suck because I mean, that's, that's a hard road to walk. It's a tough life. <laughs> to only do it, to only do it with no reprieve from anything else. That, that'd be hard. That'd be really hard. Hmm. Sweet. I wish I was man enough to do that. I don't know. Some <laughs> days, some days I quit early. It's like, this was not a good choice. I should have stayed home. <laughs> no, I mean, that's like us on the coast with like coastal cutties. It's like some days they're there. Some days you catch a hundred. Some days you won't see them like in like 10 <laughs> yeah. trips. It's like the worst. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, that's everything I got, man. Thanks for spending some time with us and joining us. That was awesome. Um, yeah, Absolutely. We'll have to do the geezer once we get that thing back in stock and um you can buy gunner's flies on his site or rioproducts.com uh definitely check out his sick tire stuff um it's sick and you have an awesome youtube too so thank you yeah, yeah. It's been a lot of years of youtubing uh <laughs> if you uh, if you're into tying flies that's what most of it's focused on um and then all the fishing stuff really just promotes the flies that i, I tie yeah, I couldn't. Which, I could never do the book stuff like you. Uh, like when I started, there was a little YouTube and not much. So like the the amount of resource that's out there now is awesome. So yeah, that that, that was a game changer. For yeah, sure. cool man. For sure. Well, you uh, have a great night and uh, thanks for coming. And look forward to seeing what other patterns you come up with. I just saw a prototype that looked pretty awesome. So we won't say anything, it. but coming soon, hopefully. <clears throat> Esox. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks everybody and have a good night, Gunner. All right on. Take cool. care, guys. Take care, buddy.